Okay, I think I've got this going. Um, this is the second video I've made for History 1111. I'm trying to keep these on some fun topics, um, and my critics told me I kept my eyes closed last time, so they're open this morning. Um, today we're going to talk about hieroglyphics. Hieroglyphics, you probably already know, that was the written language of the ancient Egyptians. And according to my notes that I have here on my desk, we have some hieroglyphics as old as 3300 BC or BCE, whichever you prefer to use. So we're talking about uh, a language that's about 5,000 years old. Well, hieroglyphics are very interesting because they aren't exactly like the alphabet language we have, where every letter has a particular sound. You put letters together to not only make sounds, but also meanings. Hieroglyphics, I'm going to show you a very crudely drawn picture here in just a minute, include both logographs, that's just a fancy word that means uh, word signs or word writing. A logograph is a symbol that in and of itself has a particular meaning. It does. It's just like a single symbol, and it can mean an entire word to us. The Greek, uh, excuse me, the Egyptians also had hieroglyphs that were specifically alphabetical letters. But now here's the tricky part: you have some things that can be both a letter and a logograph. So a single uh, symbol. And what I'm going to show you today is water. Water, when it's drawn as a hieroglyph, can just mean water. The whole symbol means that one word. Or it can just be the letter N. So when you see a hieroglyph and you're translating and it looks like water, it could mean water, it could mean river, uh, stream, or it could just mean the letter N. How do people know who read hieroglyphics know exactly what they mean. Well, you know from probably uh, taking the SAT or from your high school classes, you have to look at the context. Uh, would it, in context, would the little water symbol be an N or would it make more sense if it meant river? Um, there's also another type of hieroglyphics called demotic. It's sort of shorthand hieroglyphics. In your readings, you're going to see that people trained for years to learn how to write hieroglyphics well and beautifully. Of course, you had your very best scribes writing down important documents. But for everyday use, the Egyptian used some, Egyptians used something called demotic, which is sort of like a hieroglyphic shorthand. It's not nearly as complicated or as detailed. But the hieroglyphics in and of themselves, if you've ever seen pictures, there's some pictures in the course. Uh, it's it's very beautiful, and we know, although they've faded, that probably the scrolls and temple carvings that we have today were painted and just very, very beautiful, bright colors and so on. We don't really have those. I mean, hello, it's been 5,000 years, but we know that they were very beautiful at one time, and you'll see some pictures of those in the course. I also want you to know what the Rosetta Stone is. I don't mean the language translation program you can buy at Barnes & Noble. I'm talking about the actual stone. I've been to the British Museum twice, been up close and personal with the Rosetta Stone. Um, it has three sections. The top section is actually in formal hieroglyphics. The middle section is in sort of that shorthand I talked about called demotic. And the bottom part is in ancient Greek. That was the key to translating hieroglyphics. People had tried for a long time to translate them and just couldn't figure it out because they didn't understand that the little squiggle could be a river, it could be a stream, it could be the letter N, it could be all kinds of things. A French man named Champollion, you'll read about this in the course, was able to kind of puzzle it all out and figure out just the basics of hieroglyphics. I'm not going to spoil the secret of how he did that. I want you to read about it because I can guarantee you, see this is why you watch these videos, the word hieroglyphics is going to be on the midterm exam and the definition I want is a form of writing used by the ancient Egyptians. Because if you write form of writing, that's not significant. I need to know who used it. Um, so there you go. There's a hint for the midterm. Let me show you my little crude hieroglyphic drawings here. If 
Forgive me, I'm still learning. All right. There are some logo graphs. Um, the top one looks like a little circle with a cross on top. That's the word, that one symbol means the word nefer, which means beautiful. The circle with a dot in the middle, it can be the letter R, but it also can mean the word sun. The little box with a door opening and a line is per or house. Now there's your little squiggle. It can equal an N, just like a letter, or it can also mean water. So let me slide down here and you can look at the alphabet. A foot is B. A filled in circle is cr. The little squiggle of water, it could be a river, but it could also just be the letter N. Uh, that half circle is a T, and that funny little crook is an S. So you can see the difference between the logo graph in water and then when it's used in context to uh, determine whether or not it means water or just simply the letter N. The other thing I'd like you to remember about uh, Egyptian writing is there are not many vowels. In fact, King Tut, his name was actually Tut-Unk-Umen, but we, when we're translating it to English, we fill in the vowels. We could technically translate that last part as A-M-O-N, A-M-U-N, A-M-E-N, A-M-A-N. It just doesn't really matter. We know that there was a vowel there and different writers or translators will fill it in. That's why you might see his name spelled uh, Tutank Amman with an O or with an A or with a U. And the same is true of Nefertiti. Well, her name was actually Nefert. Well, we just fill in the E's and the I's and make it Nefertiti. Uh, again, you might see it spelled a little different. Usually her name is spelled uh, the same most times, but Tutankhamun's name is uh, sometimes spelled a little differently. Uh, just for grins, there is my name in hieroglyphics. It, there are some symbols for vowels. Again, they're rare. In this case, that little thingy at the end is a reed, and it can be used as an I, or it can just be a reed. So if I translate my name without vowels, Dimakana, I guess is how you say it, um, according to the Hieroglyphic Dictionary, uh, hand, owl, basket, water, reed. I have absolutely no idea <clears throat> what that's supposed to mean, but that's what my name looks like in hieroglyphics. I'd also like you to look at this picture. Um, it's called a cartouche. And I'll give you a hint. This was the key to translating hieroglyphics. Cartouches were reserved for gods, pharaohs, really, really important people. The Egyptians believed their pharaohs were gods. And you can see there's a symbol that you, a couple symbols you already know. The one for sun is at the beginning. And the one at the end, well, it looks like a person. And in fact, that's exactly what it means in this context. But the actual translation is Umener. Got to fill in the vowels there. This is the name of the sun god, Amun-Ra. Now notice I spelled it A-M-U-N. I could have spelled it A-M-A-N. Uh, I could have actually put R-E instead of R-A. But it just depends on the translator. And if you read Egyptian texts or read about the Egyptians, you're going to see lots of inconsistencies. Uh, Amun, 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 whatever. But it's all talking about the same thing. So I hope that that's been entertaining. There are a lot of websites you can find to translate your name into hieroglyphics. Uh, hopefully your artwork is better than mine. Hope you enjoyed this uh, brief introduction.